On February 22, 2011, at lunchtime, the city was rocked by a much more violent magnitude 6.3 earthquake. 181 people were killed. Several hundred people were injured, and the city was faced with major damage to buildings and homes. Rock faults, landslips, power outages, infrastructural damage, and extensive liquefaction. There have been 13 major quakes since September 4th, but a mammoth effort coordinating experts from around the world is underway to rebuild the city. And the job has been huge, but we are making real progress. More than 500,000 tons of silt from liquefaction was removed from properties and roads. 600 kilometers of roads were seriously damaged. Most have been temporarily repaired and only 20 roads are currently closed. Permanent repairs will be completed over a five-year period. 611 kilovolt power cable faults have been repaired and a new substation built. 124 kilometers of water mains were damaged but 100% of the city outside of the CBD now has access to reticulated water. Permanent repairs will be undertaken over a five-year period. Over 1,000 people are working on roads and the water, stormwater and sewer systems, and this is expected to peak at 3,000 to 4,000 by late next year. 300 kilometers of sewer pipes need to be replaced. 11 kilometers of large diameter pressure mains have already been replaced. The city has wastewater flowing in all streets apart from residential red zones where the land is unlikely to be suitable for residential occupation for a considerable time. Hello, I'm Roger Sutton. I'm Chief Executive of CERA, the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority. CERA is the organisation created to facilitate the rebuild of Christchurch. And since April we've been working hard to get this underway. Christchurch has always been a great city and I believe this is a this is a great opportunity to rebuild a new future and make it an even better place than it was before. But it's going to be a hard job. Because the earthquakes cause so much land damage, and to cope with that, there's going to be some changes to the way homes are built. And that will depend on the land they sit on. In some cases, foundations are going to have to be bigger and stronger to cope with any further quakes, but that will not necessarily affect everyone. So in this panel discussion today, we're going to discuss how the changes affect you. With me, representatives of all the key organisations we're working with at the moment. Reid Stiven from EQC, Malcolm McMillan from the Department of Building and Housing, Mike Jacker from Tolkien and Taylor, and Dean McGregor from IAG, the insurance company. As most of you know, the green zone has now been divided into three new technical categories TC1 or grey, TCT, TC2 or yellow, and TC3 blue. And the big question is for many is why? Engineering firm Tonkin and Taylor um, have been analysing the land, working for Sarah for months on this. So Mike, tell us about what the earthquakes actually did to the land and why the earthquake has affected the land in different places and in different ways. Well, I think firstly it's important to understand the perspective of what's going on here. Um, as jet engineers working for EQC for over 35, 40 years in New Zealand, we've never seen a natural disaster cause this much land damage um, over such a wide area. Um, same goes if we look around the world. There's never been this level of land damage in an urban area um, from liquefaction before. Um, and even worse than that, I suppose, if you think about the, the February earthquake, the land damage we had there was 10 times what we had in the September earthquake. So it really is a, an unprecedented scale we're dealing with here. So what Tonkin and Taylor's been doing with EQC and with, with CERA has been mapping um, and assessing the residential land damage across Canterbury um, to inform what goes forward into the recovery. So on the plains we've looked at land level changes, settlement, um, and that's thinned the ground's crust and that reduces its capacity to be able to support building foundations. Um, we've also seen lateral spreading which occurs sideways movement towards streams and waterways um, which pulls the land apart. Um, so in the areas that Sarah and the government have zoned red, um, land is so badly damaged that it's unlikely to be able to rebuild for a considerable period of time. Um, to varying degrees it's sunk um, and it's, it's stretched with this lateral spreading. Several metres in places in fact of, of lateral spreading. Um, and it's that lateral spreading I guess which is the, the biggest concern because it poses the greatest threat to life safety in people's homes. Um, while we can d design houses to withstand shaking and, and settlement, 
um, it becomes a lot more difficult and costly to try and um, design houses to be safe when the land tears apart underneath them. Uh, so the important difference between the red zones and, and the areas that Sarah and government are zoned green um, is that in the red zones, repairing that land damage and getting it safe to occupy again requires area-wide works. You'd need basically treat it as if it was a new subdivision. Clear the land, clear everything, do large-scale works, huge disruptions to communities every long time to get that work done. Um, in addition to the houses, a lot of which are uneconomic to repair, um, there's also the infrastructure which has been very severely damaged and would need to be effectively completely rebuilt in those areas. Um, I guess the good news comes in the green zones um, where properties can be repaired on an individual basis. They don't need that area-wide work to go on. Um, and also the infrastructure in those areas hasn't been so badly damaged. So, so that area-wide stuff, that's building really big stone walls, maybe metres, 10 metres wide, 10 metres deep, and then building up so much smoke that Yeah, that exactly. So as well as those perimeter treatments, um, large-scale engineering works around the edges, also a large amount of filling up of the land to bring it up to a higher level to give you a, a thicker crust to build upon. So, so taking that science into, into account, that meant we at Sarah had to look at different ways of making the region a safe place for people to rebuild, including ways, um, ways of managing the land. And that's why we've now got three different categories within the green zone, TC1, TC2 and TC3. Land that's in the TC3 area is going to be more susceptible in general to liquefaction in another quake. And that may mean housing in those areas may need more robust foundations. Malcolm, can you tell us a bit more about these new foundations and what, and what it means? Certainly can. So um, as you, many people will be aware, since September uh, a lot of geotechnical and other specialists have been doing a lot of work to understand the land and, and how that's behaved and, and what sort of condition the land's in. Um, equally, people have been doing a lot of work around buildings and how do we design buildings in future to be robust and strong enough to, to behave well in a future um, significant earthquake event. It's important to understand that if you're in the green zone, regardless of the, er uh, the technical category that you've been given, uh, the land is generally well, good enough for you to rebuild on. Uh, some areas have behaved um, better than others and we've got some, uh, some guidance around how to, how to build in those areas. I'll, I'll briefly go through the technical categories in a little bit of detail shortly and try not to get too technical, um, but it's important uh, that um, it's important that people understand the technical categories, technical category one, two and three, really only apply to properties where they have a damage to their foundations. So if you don't have any de foundation damage and you don't need to repair or rebuild those foundations. And or, the land is okay. And the land is okay. You've, maybe you've got a little bit of minor earthquake damage in the house, the roof or the chimney. Look, you should be really working through your insurer and any project management office and getting on with those repairs. And, and these technical categories aren't that relevant to you. So these are really all about the foundations. And the department has developed a, a suite of guidance around um, how to rebuild and repair some of these foundations. So I'll get into some of the detail on the technical categories. Technical category one uh, is really about uh, determining how the land will um, behave in a future significant uh, earthquake. And when we say significant earthquake, we mean a Richter, Richter scale six or greater earthquake. So it's been uh, determined that in technical category one ca classified um, sites, um, it's unlikely that those sites will suffer any, uh, any land damage from liquefaction in a significant earthquake in future. Technical category two, or yellow as people are calling it, um, there's, a, there's a minor to moderate uh, likelihood of land damage in a future significant earthquake, and so we'll need to ensure that we build the right foundations uh, if people are repairing or so rebuilding. So a bit stronger than we used to be building, we're not radically different in any real way, Mark. Absolutely That's correct, right, yeah. yep. And in technical category three, these are areas where it's been determined that they, they suffer a moderate to significant likelihood of land damage in a future significant earthquake, and so we really need to ensure that we build strong, robust foundations that can cope with that risk. Uh, simply put, it's about building foundations to suit the land conditions. So are there designs for those sort of foundations right now in TC3? Can I, can I, go, can I build a house right now in one of those TC3 areas? For TC3 uh, property owners, there will be a need to get a specific site-specific geotechnical investigation to determine the land conditions on those sites. Uh, so they'll have a geotechnical engineer go and do that, and then a, uh, a structural engineer will design foundations to suit that site. So that, that, that's, uh, that's not uncommon practice in many parts of the country today. Um, you know, in Wellington, where I, I've spent a bit of time working, uh, you know, topographies like this and people are building on the edge of cliffs and hillsides, it's quite common to get geotech investigations and structural engineers to design but things. But for a number of people in that TC3 area, 
once they've had that geotech report, then they're going to need perhaps the same foundation you have in a TC1 or a TC2 area. It doesn't mean everybody's going to need one of these you know, strong foundations, is it? That's absolutely correct. I think the geotechnical investigation that will be carried out will really determine uh, the true um, behaviour of that land and the condition of that land. And, and, and it's conceivable that some people who have a technical Category 3 classification today, after a site-specific geotechnical report, may find that a technical Category 2 foundation is, is more than adequate to suit their conditions. So, Reid, do, do we know roughly how many houses are in these, are in these different categories? Yeah, Roger, we're looking at about 28,000 houses through TC3, but we estimate three to 4,000 that are going to require foundation repair. So we, we've got a quite a heavy involvement in that. I'd like just to go back to what Malcolm said, though, that for people with no foundation damage, they're not affected, they can move on. And if they sit with our PMO now or with one of the insurer's PMOs, they're able to keep driving that work and get their homes repaired. Um, for us, even if you fall within that three or 4,000, we've got a bit of work to do there. It's likely that we're going to have to go back and have a look at those foundations because we would uh, assess them under, the, under the, the existing code at the time and there's going to be some upgrade. And we're going to have to work closely with the insurers around that. We've already agreed um, that we need to work hand in hand and we're going to set up a specialist team so we can do that. So what you're saying is you want to try and avoid situations where someone's got land damage and foundation damage and you're going to be bounced back between EQC and the insurer, you're going to try and work really hard to stop that from happening? Really hard. Trying to get some protocols together now so that if um, Dean, for instance, at IAG has got a home, uh, that they're taking care of the repair. There's also some land remediation, which we'll touch on a bit more later, that they can undertake that on our behalf as well. But importantly, if you're in our PMO, you require um, foundation upgrade, then our PMO will take care of that. It's possible that some of those homes, once we've got the design, will go over cap and pass off to the insurer and then the gen technical investigation around the foundations at that time would sit with the insurer. So you know, EQC is the organisation that manages, manages, does all that sort of fixing up the land damage. Who's going to pay for repairing the land damage in these places? Right? How does that work? That's us. We um, e EQC insure land. So um, if I can just cover that off Roger, I think it's important that people have a good understanding of what that land cover is. So um, on your home for instance, we cover the, uh, the platform on which your home is built eight metres of land around that, the same with the garage, under and around it. And for your garden sheds and what we consider pertinent structures, the same rules apply to that. We also cover land on your access way within 60 metres of the dwelling, and we cover retaining walls. And that's important for people on the Port Hill, slightly different cover for retaining walls, but we can talk to that later. So we're going really well. We've um, only got about 6,000 geotechnical land assessments. They're not foundation assessments left to do, and currently we're loading 46,000 of those reports now. So. I think a lot of people in that, in that TC3 area um, who've got serious damage to their houses, serious damage to their land, they're hearing about these going to need this fancy geotech work done. Dean, tell us about who's going to pay for this geotech report, you know, if, you've got a, if you need a new foundation or a foundation repair, and who's then going to pay for potentially you know, a fancy new foundation? Sure, Roger. Well, I think the, the positive news there is if it's a claim that's being managed by IAG, and I can talk about what we're specifically doing at IAG, um, but my understanding is that most of the industry will follow yep. um, in the same way. I think the important thing there is that you know you do check with your own insurer or your own insurance broker just to make sure that the, your policy does respond in that way. But in the main, if you're insured with IAG, and, and our brands are NZI, State um, and Lantern, so one of those insurers will be written b underwritten by IAG, then we include compliance costs as a part of the, the rebuild or the repair of your home. As you've heard, um, you know, these costs are only going to be incurred where the, the foundation is damaged and needs to be repaired. So, so those costs will automatically be incorporated. If we were looking specifically at technical category 1, we're going to see some minor increase in costs. Technical category 2, again, some increase in costs, and we'll be following the Department of Building and Housing guidelines on those. So might see some more reinforcing in those types of costs. They'll be included by our project management office in the scope of works they carry out when they, they do a detailed assessment of that property. In technical category 3, there's going to be some more specialists involved. So you're going to have a geotechnical engineer that will look at the site, they'll determine what the conditions and ground conditions are at that site. Then as we've heard, there'll be a structural engineer that needs to design foundations that are particular to that site and for the building that's being built. And then there's increased costs, because as you said, we're building a stronger and a bigger foundation. So all of those costs typically are covered under the insurance policy. The only qualification to that is that we have that $100,000 cap, or if there's multiple events or damage from multiple events, it may be managed by EQC as opposed to the private insurer. So but you're saying so for the vast majority of people, if they're in TC3 and they're getting a, um, significant repairs or a rebuild in that area, it's, it's going to be the insurer's cost, in your view, who'll pay for the geotech report and will pay for potentially quite a, you know, a fancy new foundation. 
Yeah, absolutely. We'll be following um, the engineer's advice on what it's going to take to provide a, a consent for that property in terms of making it compliant with all current code um, practices. So, And whatever the engineer comes up with, that'll be what insurers pay for. So right now, if I, wanted to, if I was going to build a brand new house in a TC3 area, I was going to do it myself, are there designs available so I could do it with a foundation right now? So if you're in a TC3 pro uh, categorised property, um, an engineer can take that geotech report and design a foundation that will suit your home. But we do want to en encourage a lot of consistency and standardisation and, and make things as cost effective as we can. So the department's been working on a number of different foundation designs and, and some people will be aware that we've been doing some research and testing of those out at the QE2 site. And uh, we've been simulating some earthquakes there with um, underground explosives to, to get some liquefaction and test those new foundation designs. We hope to have that work finished and a report published by about December this year and then all going well, um, some new technical guidance out in the new year around some foundation designs for TC3 areas. So what you're saying is if I was really keen, I could rebuild right now, even in a, a real TC3 area, there are designs available right now, but you're working hard to try and bring the cost down, is that what I'm hearing? We are. We want to standardise some of that and come up with a sort of a paint by numbers solution so that that avoids um, you know, having to do this over and over again. So the advice really would be hold back for a bit because there's going to be some cheaper Easier to do foundation designs coming, is that fair? Mark? Look, all going well with our testing and, and on the assumption that we get a good outcome with that, you know, that's certainly our hope. Cool. Well, one thing that's, that people talk to me a lot about is the whole thing about what's the difference between being in the red zone and the TC3. You know, there's some people are saying, gee, I, I'm, in, I'm, I'm a TC3 area across the road or you know, down the road is, is red. Surely I should, be, I should be in red as well. Mike, do you want to just talk briefly about in general, what are the differences between people that went red, and and the classic sort of the, and the and the TC3 areas? People, people want to understand that. Yeah, I guess if we touch back to what I said earlier, in those areas that have been zoned red, they would have required large-scale engineering works, area-wide works, complete demolition of the land and everything, starting from scratch. Um, in the areas that are green, including the TC3 areas there are individual solutions that people can do for their foundations. They don't need to rely on this area-wide work to, to go on. So the area-wide work of these big walls, you know, maybe 10 metres wide, 10 metres deep, exactly. that were taking years and years to build, and then maybe filling the land, is that the sort of stuff? Exactly, yeah. And so in the TC3 areas, like you can in the TC2 and the TC1, there are foundations you can do on your own site um, to get on and rebuild with confidence on that land without the need for this large-scale improvement to go on. So does that mean though there aren't going to be some people whose land actually looks like it's more badly damaged who are TC3 than someone who's read this land that just doesn't, that looks worse even, even though it's, can tell us about that. Exactly, so, so there's some areas around town which to look at them you'd think my god it's terrible but we've done the testing around those areas, put down those, um, those deep drill holes and found out that perhaps five metres down there's actually good ground and so you can quite easily pile down into that ground just like you would in a lot of places that had peat around Christchurch. So quite similar to what what's already been done in the past. Thanks Mike. So Reid, there is going to, still going to be perhaps a small number of people whose houses have turned green where they're not going to be able to rebuild, where the land is going to be written off. Tell us about that. Yep, we expect not too many of these, Roger. Uh, we would settle them once the engineers have confirmed that they're beyond economic repair. We would work to what we call the minimum lot size or size site, which basically is under the district plan over that property, what's the smallest subdividable section? we then achieve a registered valuation on that. Now that's a market valuation on September 4. So it, and it will feature the unique features of the property and um, we do um, recent sales analysis so it really does reflect the market valuation. We do a sim simple test against comparing that a bit against repair cost and if a repair is uneconomic we pay the person the minimum lot size. They would then retain ownership of the section. So they can move on to and buy another parcel of land, but they still retain ownership of the original parcel. And how would the insurer tend to treat that, Dean? Well, in those circumstances, Roger, if you can't rebuild on the site that you had simply because the land you know, can't be remediated, then we would treat that property as a total loss and, and the customer would have the option to either rebuild on another site or, if it was a cash settlement, take a market value settlement. So there's also been quite a lot of talk about going out and trying to get in your own geotech engineer, now your TC3. I mean, the advice is, though, what do you do? Should you be hiring your own geotech engineer? What should people be doing right now if you're TC3 and you need a rebuild? 
Well, we think it's probably best to work through us. Most, most of the major insurance companies have project management offices, and we're working very closely with EQC. There are some things that we need to consider, like, you know, does the, is there land damage that might need to be repaired by EQC? It's really important that we get those things aligned and operating at the same time. Otherwise, you'll have multiple contractors coming to site, and it's going to be a real disruption for the homeowner. We think we can make that process a lot smoother by working really closely with EQC and involving the geotech at the same time. And Malcolm, there's been a bit of discussion around if I'm TC3, is that going to end up on my limb? Do you, do, what do you know about that? Yes, yeah, so the council is going to put that information on their public records, um, but people needn't fear that. Equally, the geotech reports themselves and then the records of the building consent work that's been happened to repair the foundations will all be on the public record as well. So people will see the full picture and the full story. So what you're saying is so if you went out and you'd got, you know, that geotech work was done by your insurer and they discovered your land was TC2, that, 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 that geotech report goes on the limb so people can see that in the future as well? Correct. And I guess, I guess if you get a foundation design and it's done to this standard, whatever that standard is, that also goes on the limb so people can see? Absolutely. Okay. Tell me, tell me, about, tell me about the other sort of strange cases we're getting, Reid, things like where there's maybe some cosmetic damage to the house, but maybe the land has sunk. Well, what are some of those scenarios there? Really technical for us, those ones, Roger. It, it, there are going to be properties where the land has sunk so much there's little damage to the house where we're actually going to have to lift the house, perhaps uh, jack it up in the air, hold it there, or move it completely off site while we repair, repair the land underneath. Now, when we put it down, if the council or the consenting authorities require us the new foundation system, then we would take care of that at the same time. So are there going to be many of those? Is that, is that going to be a big issue? Uh, waiting for the LiDAR data, which is really critical for, for both EQC and the insurers, that's going to show, and lots of people would have heard the new term of crust thinning, Mike's alluded to it earlier on, that will, that will tell us across suburban streets and property by property actually how much settlements occurred. So we're not far away from getting that, hopefully by Christmas, and that'll allow us to um, get together with the insurers after Christmas and make a dent in the... So, so really the message is there, in some cases people are going to have damage that looks pretty cosmetic. But actually, they, get, they may actually need to do quite significant works because of that land damage under That's the right. house. So, and our role is to bring it back to the September 4 condition. So if that means lifting the house up, as I said, moving it off site, bringing the land back up, then that's what we're going to have to do. Malcolm, has there been much thinking about trying to have some sort of public database as people collect these different geotech reports across TC3? So maybe you end up with all your neighbours getting reports that... You know, you start getting a real picture of what's going on. Has there been thinking about that? There has been, and, and we're still working through how we can do that and collect that information and get a better understanding about the ground conditions and the land. And we'll probably be working fairly closely with Tonkin and Taylor and the council around how to, how to do that. So, Reid, people are also asking us at Sarah about excesses. If there's a, if it's damage to the land and damage to the house, how do excesses work here? Every, um, every land claim will attract an EQC excess, Roger. Uh, the minimum excess is $500, and that's for damage under 5,000 and that's we're likely to cash settle that and we deduct it so people don't have to write out a cheque, physically write out a cheque to EQC. Um, over 5,000 and up to $50,000 damage it becomes a 10% excess to a maximum of $5,000. So simply put if you have $3,000 or $30,000 worth of damage to your property you're going to be up for a $3,000 excess payable to EQC. How long, you know there's this whole process of repairing people's land and so on, right? How long do you think this is likely to take? Um, really focused on coordinating that through the PMO and with the insurers so that people don't have a hundred tradesmen coming to their property to effect different repairs. So um, how long is the repair of Christchurch going to take? I can't answer that question, Roger, but we're really focused on getting there quickly um, and I can reassure people that we are working hand in hand with the insurers to make sure of that. So Dean, how do you see the, 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 that, that order? Is it going to be an order you're thinking about in terms of how who gets the work done soonest and latest? Is there any sort of logic to how you're going to do that? Yeah, sure, Roger. And it's really dependent on the circumstances. So where there's um, clearly no land damage and it's just something that insurers can get on with, then yes, we're prioritising that and we're building our own sort of recovery strategy around that. Right now, we're focusing on customers who have uninhabitable homes and we'll continue to work towards you know those most worst affected customers as we work through that. But then you work into areas where there is land damage and we very much have to coordinate and work hand-in-hand -hand with Reed's team 
at EQC. So, so we'll need to follow those guys, understand you know, when they're going to repair the land damage so that we can then move contractors in to repair the home. And it really does make sense for us to work together on that so we haven't got multiple contractors turning up. Just touching on Reed's point about excesses, um, insurers also have excesses. So on the house typically there'll be excesses and they'll vary across the industry but you know, they're probably usually a couple of hundred dollars or you might have a voluntary excess that you know, could be any number higher than that if you've chosen to take a voluntary excess on your policy. Roger, just around the priority, EQC in particular, and I think Dina will agree with this, once we get right into the TC3, we will prioritise worse first. We've had vulnerability tests around all our customers from day one, and we'll apply them to ensure that the worst affected people in TC3 areas are seen first. Yeah. And, and Mike, you, you, you've still got your engineers out there doing, doing the field work. I mean, how many guys have you still got out there, and when will they finish that fundamental field work that's still sort of feeding into those land damage? Yes. So, so the geotechnical engineers who are working with EQC to assess the land damage, um, they're on the same timeline as EQC assessments. And so by Christmas that land damage assessment should be complete um, and ready to move on to that next stage of, of how do you actually rebuild. And so it's important, and, and the green zone and TC3 including that. Um, people can get on there and rebuild with their own individual solutions and own individual foundations. Um, and yes there is land damage out in the green zone, it can be quite significant in places, but with the guidance that the DBH have put through here now, there are ways that we can go ahead and build with confidence in those TC3 zones. So the message is, in those TC3 is, if you want to rebuild now, you can, our design's available, but the further work that you're doing at the Department of Building and Housing should actually reduce the cost of standardisation and lead to faster work being done as well. Yeah, and also that work that, that's ongoing is helping to build up a greater resilience for the future designs. I, mean, I think other parts of the world um, are looking at us quite closely here in New Zealand, leading the way about it. Uh, you know, how we can address this in a practical um, way to get better resilience into the, the houses in the future. A lot of talk about where am I going to find a geotech engineer. When you finish all your land assessment stuff, we're going to see geotech engineers freed up to go out and do some of this other work on a more individualised basis, Mike. Is that going to be a, you know, we're going to see more geotech engineers available to go work with Dean at, at IAG or EQC? Yeah, so the, the, whole, the whole point, I guess, of this technical classification is to prioritise that resource into where it's required, which is the TC3 areas. And then behind that is the standardisation to, get, to make the process easier for those engineers as they go through and design those foundations in the future. Well, thanks, Mike, and thanks to all our panellists. Um, I think this has been a really useful conversation that we've, we've been having. And I think the, one of the key things that come through is everybody's situation in their homes is going to be different. But the main message here is go work with your insurance company and EQC to go and find the best solution for you. Um, the CERA website, www.cera.govt.nz, um, has got more information. Um, it's also got information about community meetings we're having um, around all over Christchurch. So you can go and hear, um, hear more of these messages, but also it's a chance for you to ask your own questions as well. Thanks for joining us. Good, good afternoon.